you very much indeed for that lovely welcome. It's a, a delight to be here for the first time in, in three years. And uh, thank you all so much. I'm, I'm honoured by the turnout and I'm a little bit conscious that you could be uh, sunning yourselves or, or passing your time in more agreeable ways than reflecting on a, a subject which, uh, as has been indicated in the introduction, is, um, is a very serious one and in some ways a pretty melancholy one. If I mumble o over the next half hour, 40 minutes, please raise a hand and I'll, I'll do my best to speak up a bit. <clears throat> the world swarms with self-appointed experts on religion. A leading sociologist such as David Martin, who, who died a, f a few months ago, someone who, who's made a, a very big impact on my way of thinking on this subject, he's noted that few... Few matters are as heatedly debated and pronounced on at a moment's notice as the relationship between faith and culture. When I was invited to answer the question posed in the title of my book, responses from a gallery of figures in journalism, academia, and on the street proved tellingly confident. Consider the following, which represent my own summaries of two widely held views. First, religion does more harm than good because it's based on dubious speculation, often imposed in authoritarian ways, about what cannot be known in principle. Since there are no earthly scales capable of weighing questions relating to our final source and destiny, if any, it is better to abandon a flawed project and get on with living a decent life in the here and now. Or a view from the other side. Religion does more good than harm because the major faiths set the experience of human beings, who are often selfish or destructive, but also potentially noble, against a transcendent horizon. In this broader perspective, believers can face the future with courage and hope, learning among much else that life is worth living responsibly because it has ultimate meaning. Now let's revert to the first view and... Um, spell it out in a bit more detail. That religion does more harm than good is especially clear in our age of growing in darkenment. Blasphemy has re-emerged as a hot button issue in the West, as well as less tolerant societies. It is not only enforced by Muslims who kill cartoonists and denounce Ayan Hirsi Ali, a victim of female genital mutilation, as a rabble rouser. Toxic Islamists, resemble the toxic Christians who were once as intolerant as any Al-Qaeda or, or Daesh extremist today. The sword has been the shadow of the cross for much of Christian history. Islam has its own variants of the Emperor Constantine's notorious slogan, in this sign you will conquer. And although they are the worst offenders by dint of their size and missionary thrust, the world's two largest faiths are not a special case. The trouble really centers on religion as such, or the lion's share of it. Right now, Hindu mobs are oppressing non-Hindus in South Asia for not sharing their outlook and thus not being authentically Indian. Buddhists are displaying allied forms of chauvinism in Burma and Sri Lanka. Any reasonably open-minded person will grant that the great spiritual traditions preach worthy ideals for the most part. But they also create in-groups and out-groups by definition. So when faith isn't directly responsible for poisoning the wells of discourse and public life, it can itself be poisoned by them. Land grabs, shrill nationalism, and other mainly political evils become more pernicious still when sanctified by angry little gods. What's more, false claims to infallibility come in many forms. In North America and Europe, the antics of no platforming, trigger warning, thought police on social media represent religion transposed into a secular key. Trial by Twitter recalls the Salem witch hunts. And lastly, according to this view, there is an unbridgeable chasm between religion and science. Now let's go back to the case of the defense. That religion does more good than harm is especially clear in its status 
as our best hope in neo-pagan times. Almost all past societies have acknowledged and cultivated the spiritual dimension. For well over a century, skepticism, skepticism about faith has fed a wider spurning of goodness, beauty, and truth. Godless mo modern mores were not only seen in the horrors of Auschwitz, the Gulag, or Mao's China. They are also reflected in moral relativism, crass consumerism, large-scale family breakdown, drug abuse, and the sexualization of children. Opponents of faith should, as, as we heard in the intro, be careful what they wish for, according to this view. The secular liberal state now claims more than its due, including the right to govern a, a citizen's conscience and set norms as though the government were the only force in society that mattered. Authentic religion offers richer visions of a just humanity. The coarsening of what passes for debate both on and off the internet marks a further rejection of such visions. Much journalism misrepresents faith. I put my hands up, I, I'm a member of the tribe myself. Journalism, my trade, misrepresents faith because it alights on today's news at the expense of deeper currents. Reporters tell us about sudden volcanic eruptions, but not about the steady, barely noticed irrigation supplied by thousands of underground streams, often over many generations. Humanity is not the measure of all things. The two pearls of greatest price in most people's lives are love and happiness. Neither can be commodified. Neither is to be attained directly. The best mapping of this mysterious terrain comes in the major religions. Of course they can be put to corrupt use. Faith is like fire. It warms, but it can also burn. And just like heat, spiritual allegiance contribute, contributes greatly to our flourishing under the right conditions. The benefits have been intellectual as well as social. Whatever hotheads on either side of the debate may think, that's to say, young earth creationists on the one hand and the Richard Dawkinses of this world on the other, whatever they may think, claims of a genuine clash between religion and science are illusory. Now, these two sets of replies are, of course, sharply opposed. Other responses I heard are harder to categorize. A historian, for example, pointed out that religion is an aspect of culture. So asking whether religion does more harm than good is as futile as asking the same question about culture. John Lennon's invitation to imagine no religion thus betrays a basic misunderstanding of what religion is. You can guess at what the world might look like if Al Gore had become president of the United States, let's say, or if Germany had won the First World War. But asking how things might be now if religion or culture had never existed is a counterfactual speculation too far. This insight strikes me as crucial. Although I hope that what follows will shed light on the, on the merits and drawbacks associated with spiritual belief, the elusiveness of my theme should be underlined at the start. A Buddhist told me that the answer is simple, quote, it all depends on the practitioner. Faith can make good people better and bad people worse, unquote. A philosopher questioned whether there is any such thing as religion outside the minds of opportunistic or maybe soft-headed public servants. Quote, religion in the abstract does not exist. No one apart from politicians voices allegiance to it. It's just a catch-all term devised by 18th century rationalists to label the superstitions of the vulgar masses who weren't like them. The creeds of the major faiths are in any case mutually contradictory, so if any religion is true, then most religions are false." Unquote. A squadron of atheists, you won't be amazed to hear, told me in terms leaving no room for doubt at all that faith is profoundly harmful through fermenting violence as well as being a social and mental straitjacket. More than one quoted that line of Pascal, which we've already heard. Men never do evil. I think men is probably the, 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 the right, the, the apposite word here. Men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they act from religious conviction. 
evidence for the prosecution in the continuing suit of secularism versus God is familiar. Galileo, the Inquisition, witch burning, Christian anti-Judaism, causing or feeding evils, including the blood libel, the protocols of the elders of Zion, pogroms, and ultimately the Holocaust, religiously based gender discrimination and homophobia, the melancholy statistic that Islamist fanatics are responsible for most global terrorism today, the arrogance and cruelty of so many missionaries, see the testimony of witnesses for, uh, from Rousseau to Kipling to Levi-Strauss, Str Levi especially those uh, convinced that unconverted heathens would burn in hell for all eternity. Last, lastly, in my little poll, a Christian theologian with an open-handed attitude to faith in general praised what she sees as the richest articulation of the human spirit. And she said the following, interest in the flourishing of all beings has been placed on the moral agenda of most religious traditions. It is religion which can promote the honing of virtue and offer the securest embedding of moral community. Alongside that humanist dimension, faith adds a rationale for commitment to freedom and dignity Believers have come to see life as a freely bestowed gift and so to open up to a calling from outside themselves to accept divine mercy and make it real for others, unquote. Later in my exchange with a historian, he added an important caveat, pointing out that religion is not an abstract noun. That seems to me also a very important insight. Read a book by Richard Dawkins and, and his allies and you just get the impression that religion consists of no more than believing six impossible things before breakfast. On the contrary, religion involves typically sets of relationships between people who are agreed about basic beliefs or at least some core of commitments about ritual practice. Being a human practice, it can be used for good or ill, but so can medicine for that matter. There are doctors who have used their skill to help torturers to do a better job. These comments strike me as the shrewdest to have emerged. My argument with the philosopher was more qualified. In one sense, his insight was wholly valid. Viewed from a wide angle as it has unfolded over millennia, religion is certainly very hard to define. It would include rites in the ancient world, such as animal and human sacrifice, employed as forms of scapegoating. But to dwell at any length in such territory during a brief overview like this would be eccentric, I think. We're here concerned with the global faiths that have produced major bodies of critical thought and with the markers given by the sociology of religion. So let's, let's get down to brass tacks. What, what, what can we say by way of a of a concrete definition. Well, I, I would say that the sociology of religion views its subject as involving an apprehension and symbolic representation of sacred or non-ordinary reality. An apprehension and symbolic representation of sacred or non-ordinary reality. Scholars in this field remind us that human beings do not merely investigate the natural world at a scientific level. We also seek to make sense of our lives via all sorts of evolutionary adaptations, agriculture, dance, literature, that have emerged from animal play, animal empathy, ritual and myth during the long history of tribal societies without much sense of the beyond, through supernatural king-god monarchies, think ancient Egypt, for example, to more recent societies with their religions of value, transcending the brute givens of existence. Now with this trajectory in mind, we might point up developments during the first millennium BC. Whether or not one accepts the term axial age, which is sometimes used by, by sociologists to encompass this period, it can nevertheless be described as transformational. The ideal was contrasted with the real. 
visionary horizons of hope were set against the frustrations of the everyday world. Though expressed in different idioms across the world, the quest for transcendence, that's to say a higher dimension of reality involving more exalted values, arose in China through reflection on the way of nature, in India through worldly renunciation, in Israel through prophetic denunciation, and in Greece through theoretical reflection and the quest for wisdom. Now critics, including those who would kick away the apparently unnecessarily, unnecessary spiritual ladders that have raised us to the branches that we now perch on, these critics may nevertheless remain unmoved by these points for at least two reasons. The first is practical. Context matters, they may say, but so does the big picture. To wit, harmony between the major religions remains a remote goal. The destabilizing effects of Islamist extremism especially can be seen far from the Middle East or from Ground Zero in New York. The recent much noted return to religion across societies including Egypt, Turkey and India, a sharp, sharp reaction against secularizing drives in these countries several generations ago supplies fresh grounds for disquiet. You'll recall that uh, decades ago, secular elites in the countries that I just mentioned tended to view religion as passe, a mark of a sort of primitive mindset, and a big push was made to sideline it. Well, guess what? Religion has, has come back to bite them in, in the form of uh, fundamentalism. But that, that, of course, doesn't discredit the secularist view that fundamentalism in, in wherever it is, um, Turkey or India or in Indonesia, is, is highly regrettable. What's more formally secular challenges, such as the confrontation between Israel and the Palestinians, have taken on an overtly religious cast. Religion has played a role in recent and continuing civil wars, from Sri Lanka to Chechnya to Sudan. And along or near the 10th parallel of latitude, north of the equator, between Nigeria and Indonesia and the Philippines, religious fervor and political unrest are reinforcing each other. Other faith-based political groups, whether violent or not, are justly seen as highly divisive by their, their critics. See previous remarks about India. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and Jordan, Hamas in the Palestinian territories, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, uh, Nadlatul Ulama in Indonesia and the Zionist Christian movement in the United States, which supports illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank, of course. But are these prosecution arguments so much stronger than those voiced by the defense? I'm not just referring to the obvious point that religion is whatever else the world's greatest source of social capital or that faith-based conviction has mobilized many, millions of people to oppose authoritarian regimes, inaugurate democratic transitions, support human rights, and relieve human suffering. I'm talking also about the painstaking sociological analysis that disentangles the causes of a given conflict, demonstrating, for example, how often faith is politicized, and thus how a notionally the, the notionally religious roots of a, con a given conflict are really social problems in disguise. The troubles in Ireland bear this out. A well-known gag tells of a man being stopped at a roadblock and asked by the guard about his religion. He answers that he's an atheist. Protestant or Catholic atheist, comes the reply. In his influential polemic, God is not great, Christopher Hitchens sees deep significance in the guard's quip. It apparently shows that what he calls an obsession with religion rotted even the legendary local sense of humor. More careful observers will see that it's Hitchens who misses the force of the joke, which is really about identity. Um, a, a friend of mine, the, the atheist uh, ph um, philosopher Tim Crane, has pointed out that the, the guard's question suggests, quote, not that religion is the immovable force in the conflict, but that actual belief in God is irrelevant. What matters is what group you belong to. 
Now, I think this insight applies much more widely. The romantic nationalism underlying so much conflict over the past 200 years derives from, from history, ethnicity, and linguistic diversity as well as religion. Singling out faith-based motivation for acts of violence, as so many people constantly do, singling out religion to take all the flag is irrational because weapons are used in the name of an alleged greater good all the time. Islamist suicide bombers have learned their deadly craft from secular exemplars. It was the, it was the, um, the, 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 the Maoist Tamil Tigers who were uh, suicide bombers long, long before it occurred to any Islamists. And think of the kamikaze pilots during the Second World War. The roots of contemporary terrorism lie more in radical ideologies like Leninism, incubated in the West, than in religion. You can't get much more secular, of course, than Leninism. Across other parts of the world, faith allegiances often shade into ethnic divides, which in turn merge with claims to land, water, and oil. Now consider the example of the Balkans and the Caucasus, where religion can exacerbate differences that are fundamentally political. As I've noted elsewhere in, in, in my book, Christianophobia, which is a, a chronicle of the global persecution of Christians around the world, this theme cries out to be placed in the broader context of 19th century and post-colonial nationalism. For example, numerous Christian subjects of the Ottoman Sultan in places like Greece and Bulgaria, they thirsted for independence and a freer expression of their culture. But their chief inspirations included Napoleon and the nationalist movements that he spearheaded. We can thus find many examples of conflicts in which the adherents, uh, in, sorry, conflicts in which adherents of the same faith are enemies, just as other cases where two religions can be aligned together. It's telling that a, a classic study, which I think is, is well worth reading uh, published several days ago, uh, uh, decades ago, sorry, um, I think there was an, a, a new edition much more recently, but uh, originally published, I, I think in the 50s or 60s, Raymond um, Aron's uh, book, Peace and War, it barely, barely mentions religion at all. The Crusades and the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century are naturally central exhibits in debate about religion and violence. But far more attention should be paid, in my view, to the rise of the nation state and the homogenizing force exerted on often unwilling populations by politically driven nationalist rulers. I've lost count of the number of times that a London cabbie has blamed all the problems of the world on, on, on religion. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to occur to these armchair experts, and, and indeed to, to many others, um, just what an absolutely colossal source of violence the state, the nation state, has been, um, particularly uh, since, since the Reformation in, in Europe. In his book, The Myth of Religious Violence, William Kavanagh cites Charles Tilley's remark that war made the state, and the state made war. He also quotes a line to the effect that in the process of state building, the most serious sources of violence and the greatest spur to the growth of the state was the attempt to collect taxes from an unwilling populace. Violence also sprang from opposition among local elites to the centralizing efforts of monarchs. No wonder co-religionists could find themselves on opposite sides of, the, of political divides. Let me give you an example from much more recently. In 2001, a woman in Nigeria was sentenced to death by stoning for conceiving a child out of wedlock. Uh, this woman, Amina Lawal, I'm, I'm pleased to say, is, is, is still with us. Her case drew international attention. Initially convinced that Lawal's vile treatment could only be described to a barbarous theology, uh, a scholar in America called Sarah uh, El Tantawi wrote a book called Sharia on, on Trial. And her initial project was to, uh, to, to, to attack hardline Islamism. But as her researches unfolded, 
she came by degrees to see the story much more in terms of Nigeria's politics than, than of Islam as such. And the lesson she learned is, is encapsulated almost a millennium ago by the, the great Islamic jurist Al-Ghazali who observed that Muslim juris, jurisprudence is one-tenth text and nine-tenths context. Don't forget that stoning for adultery, of course, is um, a Jewish, it's a, it's a biblical punishment ultimately. And when, when was the last Jew stoned for adultery? I think, I think you'd be, be very, very hard pushed to, uh, to find, uh, to, d to discover when, when the last person died by, by that particularly uh, horrific form of execution. Um, so, at, at the same time, I, I think, for the sake of fairness, I would want to say that these, these counter-arguments, they don't necessarily defeat the secularist because of a second theoretical rejection of religion underlying the empirical one. Many cannot accept an analogy between religion and other forms of kinship bond. If I, if I just say, well... You know, re religion's just like, say, patriotism, and patriotism, in, in the same way that patriotism can be abused, so can religion. Um, in the eyes of the secularist, tribe, ethnicity, language, and so, so on, at least they boil down to something real, which, unlike religion, only trades in dangerous falsehoods, according to this point of view. That's why we have an issue in the first place. Take a more tangible comparison. There's plenty of scope for grown-up disagreement over the pros and cons of veganism. But there is no serious discussion to be had about the alleged benefits of crack cocaine. Readers of, of, of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire will recall his remark about how sacred rituals in the Roman Empire were viewed, how they, how, how they were viewed as true by the ignorant masses as false by the philosophers and by the magistrates as a convenient means of social control. Gibbon's successors can thus be forgiven for thinking that men and women come of age have outgrown the fantasies of yesteryear, whether or not religion's role in fermenting conflict is, is exaggerated or not. Now these thoughts propel us on to philosophical terrain. If you believe atheism to be true, then of course you're more likely to conclude that religion is inherently bogus for the simple reason that it rests on false beliefs. Um, so hard-headed thinking is needed, but at the same time, I don't think we can rely entirely on wholly disengaged analysis. I've, I've heard umpteen people say to, to Richard Dawkins, I'm not sure whether the message ever quite get through, that re religion is, you know, it, it's about... It's about setting off on, on a journey. It's about doing, um, doing things that, 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 that change you. So we need to, to attend to how faith is mapped from within. The nutritional analogy remains useful up to a point. While vegans are not the only people entitled to voice an opinion about the merits of their diet, they do possess a special warrant for commenting on what it feels like to avoid all animal products, especially if they speak with the benefit of scientific knowledge. Well, so does a Christian have authority to speak about her or his faith or, or a Muslim um, ditto. Note too where this comparison breaks down, however. In a debate for or against veganism, all informed participants will at least agree on what it is that they disagree about. If I say I love nuts and you say you don't like nuts, then, 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 then we know what it is that we, we disagree about. But it's because thoughtful believers often do not recognize the models of religion regularly peddled by secularists that we can't even begin our main discussion without substantial ground clearing. For example, people of faith regularly insist that the, that the deity rejected by Richard Dawkins is more of an inflated creature than the god of classical theism. 
I always think that the, the God in whom Richard Dawkins sis believes is is more like a a great big science professor up in the sky than than um, any deity recognised by, by by me. The the great psychologist Oliver Sacks, pa perhaps a better psychologist than a theologian, um, was raised in an Orthodox Jewish household, and he lost his faith as a schoolboy after a prayer experiment. He planted two rows of radishes, cursing one and blessing the other, before concluding that religion was a sham when both grew equally well. Did this disprove the existence of God or merely discredit the simplistic claims that Sachs had been taught? Atheists can plainly score cheap rhetorical victories by lampooning the ignorance and charlatanism of certain believers, just as some people might dismiss veganism out of hand because certain vegans are, are malnourished, or others might avoid swimming entirely on the basis that it carries a risk of drowning. But to win an argument convincingly, you need the backbone to confront a robust version of the contrary position. In our case, that, that means it's essential to probe stronger arguments of faith and the patterns of life to which thoughtful as well as hot-headed believers are rightly or wrongly committing themselves. This is hardly to draw premature conclusions, I suggest. It's simply a bid to match our tools to the task in hand. After all, would anyone take seriously a, di a discussion of whether socialism does more harm than good by ignoring Western Europe and instead focusing only on Venezuela and the Khmer Rouge? Now, thank you for your patience. I'm conscious that time's cracking on and I, I will fast forward to my conclusions in, in, in a mo. Um, but just to say that I've essentially t taken you through the, the first chapter of my book, and I think it, it is necessary after that to get into a, a little bit of philosophical nitty-gritty, which I've, I've tried to do with as, as light a touch as possible, to find out whether uh, belief in God is um, more robust philosophically than many secularists believe. That's uh, a subject dear, dear to my heart, and indeed to probe how uh, seaworthy uh, a worldview atheism is. But I also think very much that it, it's no use staying up in the clouds and taking refuge in, in generalities. You, you need to, to get down to uh, detail of the, of the, of the, of the repertoires of, of, of the different religions. I, I find myself taking a bit of an intermediate view between the, some of the people quoted in that first chapter. I think... Uh, I, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say if one religion is true, then all other religions are false. On the contrary, I, I do see some major uh, points of overlap, especially uh, among the Abrahamic faiths, of course, but, but, but not only among them, uh, aspects of Hinduism and Sikhism and, 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 and other religious philosophies. On the other hand, I don't think you can be too vague, and I, I do take issue with... Keith Ward, who uh, many of you will, will know at least by reputation, a very eminent theologian and, and a former teacher of mine, who has, has written well, well on this subject, but he, he, he's mainly a philosopher, and I, I find myself the discussion a, a little bit too theoretical. He writes at one point in his, in his uh, very interesting, stimulating book, Is Religious Dangerous? He writes, God is not some sort of arbitrary tyrant, God is apprehended as one who has a purpose in creation, who gives human beings a part to play in realizing that purpose. The purpose of God is that societies of finite personal beings should grow in knowledge and understanding, in synergy and energy with one another, and in the creation and appreciation of the beauty and intricate structure of the world. This is a growth towards greater conscious appreciation of love, beauty, and truth. Well, I, I agree with that up to a point, but you need to look, as I say, at the, at the repertoire of this or that faith. If you look at a subject like where, where a given religion, for example, stands on a spectrum of option in, in relation to, to violence, it's pretty clear that Islam and Christianity are 
rather different. It's, it's probably not an exaggeration to say that while Christianity insists on victory over the world, for example, with Islam, it's, it's, a, it's a more realistic picture of, of victory in, in the world. Christians were castigated, particularly in the early centuries, for their, for their total lack of realism because they were pacifists. And you might see the evolution of, of just war theory as a means by which the church, which of course was now the official religion of the Roman Empire, um, trimmed some of its sails, didn't necessarily cop out, although it may have copped out in some ways, but recognized that there, there's perhaps a, a fundamental instability in the language and that different standards apply to, to different contexts. After all, if Mr. Smith in, insults Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones is free to forgive Mr. Smith as an act of charity. If Mr. Smith interferes with Mr. Jones's daughter, it's for Mr. Jones to contact the police, not, not to engage in some kind of private act of, of, of forgiveness. Pope John Paul II was free to forgive his would-be assassin as, a, as an act of Christian charity, but uh, the, the man who shot him, the Pope was not free to proclaim release to the captive. The man, the man who, who tried to murder the Pope did, did have to go to, to prison to serve his sentence. Uh, there is quite a lot about Islam in particular, as you might expect in, in the latter part of my book, also uh, a good deal about Hinduism and, and Buddhism. Um, you'll be familiar with that, that, that um, lampooning that Hollywood stars sometimes get for, for rather soft-headed views about Buddhism. I've got a soft spot for Buddhism, and I think it it proclaims some, some, some marvelous principles and standards. The difficulty precisely lies in its lack of a doctrinal base. If you, if you start, rather like Hinduism, with an open door policy, if you start with open house, religiously speaking, then you shouldn't be amazed if, if you get squatters. And there are people at the moment writing books, sort of great crises de cœur about how uh, Hinduism has been distorted by the, the BJP. The trouble is, and, and I, I, I can see why they say that, and India has become, sadly, a, a much more chauvinistic society than, than it was when, when it was more secular. The problem is that it's much more, much more difficult trying to explain, for Hindu reasons, why somebody like Narendra Modi gets Hinduism wrong. Uh, on the subject of Islam, my, my view, cutting a very long story short, is, is that it doesn't require a reformation. The point to really grasp, if, if we're trying to get a, a map and compass through this very, very complicated contentious field, is that Islam has, has been undergoing a reformation of sorts for about 200 years now, and the results have been as blood-soaked as, as the European reformation. Rather, I think, um, Muslims uh, would be well advised to uh, excavate resources that they, that they already they already have, uh, a, a bit like with Christian fundamentalism, which isn't really, in my view, a genuinely traditional expression of Christianity. There, there's this tendency to, to leapfrog centuries of, of reflection. And so in, 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 in a nutshell, the trouble with a lot of so-called Islamism is that it isn't authentically Islamic. And uh, Bodies like the, the Quilliam Foundation are doing great work at the moment to, to explain that. The hardline Islamist is not likely to renounce violence for secular liberal reasons. He will, he will do it for uh, Islamic reasons when he becomes better informed. Now, is, is all that essentially a defensive argument? In other words, 
given the tendency of human beings to cling to their mythologies, am I just saying that the least worst option is to accentuate the positive? For many humanists, uh, looking on themselves as the undeceived, humanism, pure and simple, remains the truest path. Now, I think that this view is vulnerable to attack for reasons that I've already hinted at, because secular visions of the good life often borrow from theology without due recognition. Where on earth do you, do you get your belief in the dignity of every human being? Excuse me, that is not self-evident from secular reason, not, not a bit of it. It comes straight out of the, out of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Philosophers standing in the liberal tradition of John Stuart Mill will have enormous problems with examples including a, a voluntary gladiatorial contest. We could note that there are people who will engage in such combat for a sufficiently large amount of money with the assurance that the millions earned will go to their family if they lose. There are people who are prepared to, to fight to the death. The spectacle would only be available to paying customers behind high fences, supposing somebody suggested that. What would be wrong with that on purely libertarian grounds? Well, from a strict secularist point of view, it's very difficult to say. It's likewise very difficult to spell out what is wrong with bestiality on purely libertarian grounds. The only, the only way to do so would be by holding that it's incompatible with a strong sense of the dignity of the person. Now, ever since Kant, the, the father of modern philosophy in the 18th century, opinion formers have been trying to give a rational account of such dignity without theological underpinnings. And I think that it's, it's really hard. In, in essence, human rights discourse cannot be disembedded from broader philosophical and, I would say, theological traditions. Rights divorced from an innate sense of human dignity can easily sink into a battle over rival entitlements, as I think is happening uh, increasingly in the Western world now. It could be added in passing that if civil society is ever to be fully secured in China, it will have, it, uh, it, it will have much to do with the vast spiritual revival now unfolding in a land where religion was said to have been expunged entirely as recently as the 1970s. And of course, the moral desert left by Mao is gradually showing signs of new life. China will be the world's largest Christian country um, within probably about 20 years. And you might say, well, it, 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 it is the largest country in the world and will be still the second largest when it's overtaken by India. But that doesn't begin to give any idea of the extraordinary religious revival going on in China at the moment. It's, it's the largest in history. Uh, secularists may be shocked about this, but it's very worth drawing attention to the fact that when, when they realized in the, in, the, in the 80s how very far behind they were behind the Western world, they said to themselves, right, we don't have a market economy, check. We'll, we'll introduce that. They also said, and we don't have authentic spiritual traditions and of course some of the the the, the uh, indigenous ones are, uh, are being revived in a big way as well another problem with secularism worth sketching in brief is is its own gods all the more detrimental perhaps because they are never recognized as such and tom wright points out that nature ab abhors a vacuum philosophically as well as uh, in the in the domain of physics so that pagan deities from antiquity, Mars the god of war, Mammon the god of money, Aphrodite the goddess of erotic love, they're still worshipped in, in fresh guises. So, granted all these factors, a viable conclusion in three parts. I would say religion does more harm than good when its practitioners are intolerant or violent. Religious bodies are not incapable of error. Their representatives can easily make statements going far beyond the basic natural perception of the mystery of existence. Such statements can lead to, to mistakes, conflict, and other evils, including the idolization of community identities. In certain respects, the history of religion maps onto the entire social history of humanity. The problem is especially significant in parts of the, the Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist worlds today, 
Christian societies were deeply marked by such stains as recently as the 30s and 40s, but are on the whole much more tolerant, true to a combination of the, their direct roots and to secular enlightenment, soil itself partly watered by Judeo-Christianity. So, um, score draw, not, not quite. Thirdly and ultimately, I think that religion does more good than harm because like science or music, we need it. Tone-deaf people can go through life without delighting in songs or symphonies, but most of us feel enriched by music at some level. You can shun technology by going to live in an Amish-style commune. The majority would avoid such a drastic step. Religion is the most contested element of the triad, but most people in most cultures, present as well as past, would accept my premise. Beyond this stands an especially important notion that human understanding is not exhausted by mapping the world of nature. People will always ask larger questions about what the good life consists in. And through seeking answers, they will stumble upon moments, places, relationships, and experiences that have a numinous character, as though removed from this world and in some way casting judgment upon it. For pastors and spiritual leaders, the need is for public expressions of faith that are broad enough to be inclusive, fostering the ability to live and move uh, within a given spiritual heritage and not be narrowed by it, but also firm enough to be rooted in what has been received from the past and to cast necessary judgment on the spirit of the age where appropriate. Though the vision is not easy to implement in every particular, it can nevertheless be spelt out with reasonable clarity in headline terms. And, and now I really will round off. Conviction and dogmatism are not the same. There is a difference between having seen some truth and claiming to speak in the name of all truth, between knowing what one believes and refusing to respect the beliefs and experiences of others. People of faith should speak with a humble authority, combining real knowledge with an awareness of the limitations of that knowledge. Their authority, to coin a powerful image used by John Habgood when he was Bishop, uh, Archbishop of York a generation ago, is not that of the wise woman or man and the scholar, important though wisdom and scholarship are, but that of lo lovers who express their delight in what they love, even though they have scarcely begun to glimpse its full extent. Thank you very much. <laughs>